very happy to have Dr. Kathy Frierson with us this afternoon. Um, Dr. Frierson is a professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. She received her PhD in history from Harvard University, and she was most recently with us in the past year as a senior visiting scholar at the Davis Center, and we are very lucky to have her, just as we're lucky to have her here today. She is going to discuss um, sort of how the gulag and how terror um, impacted people's everyday lives in the USSR. So thanks so much for being here, Kathy. You're quite welcome. Now I will tell you that my delivery will be a little bit slower than Chris's uh, and a little bit less formal, but I hope uh, that we'll be able to touch on a lot of material in the course of this presentation and discussion. Uh, one of the things that we should add to my introduction, I think, is that most recently I've been working on questions related to the Gulag. I published a book in 2010 called Children of the Gulag, which focused on children whose parents were deemed to be uh, enemies of the people or traitors to the motherland, and the children were orphaned, either partially or entirely, or uh, they were sent into exile with their exiled parents and so forth. Uh, and for that work, I interview, started to interview child survivors in 2005, uh, and I have been working in this field ever since. Before that, I spent my life in the 19th century in the Russian village. Um, but this is, I will tell you, uh, I am the child who sits in your classroom uh, and is twitching the whole time, so I am so glad that I have found oral history so I don't have to sit still in libraries <laughs> anymore. So, um, so that is, that's how I made my way into the gulag. Uh, this was an unexpected request because I'm not a historian of everyday life, but uh, this gave me the opportunity to think about the ways that Gulag, the larger terror, and then all of the security police and the security organs made their way into everyday life. And I think the fact that I did oral history doing life history interviews with these people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, I took me along paths of understanding that I would never, ever have gone if I had not sat and listened to these people. So that's the background. So I'm not a gulag specialist, uh, but I'm more uh, interested in how this made its way into the human experience. And I have to say, it's been surprising. So this has been a fun talk to, to prepare. But it's not going to be as polished as Chris's, so. All right, so, and, and also, she's got a Mac. I've got a Dell at home. Well, this is, this is a PC, at least. Is, is it a PC? Yeah, it, oh, it's, it's, just a, it's just a wee one. Well, it's hard, <laughs> yeah. so let's see what I can do. All right, so I thought we would organize the material around these four questions. Uh, where did it penetrate daily life? How did it penetrate daily life? When did it penetrate daily life, and whose daily life did it penetrate? And in this case, uh, it refers to the gulag. And the next slide, we're going to turn to what I mean by the gulag, or gulag. Um, but so here, it's, I realize that the antecedent is two items, and it only refers to one, but that's the larger sense of the gulag. So <clears throat> most of you know, how many of you have, have done study of the gulag in some, or read about it in some course or in your own private reading? Okay. So you know that gulag is an acronym uh, that I was going to have everybody write because I'm, one, I'm, a, I'm not a very Soviet teacher. I'm very interactive. I've actually done State Department programs on pedagogy in the Soviet Union, post-Soviet Union. So I thought everybody should practice writing this word in Russian. Gulag, that's how you would write it. Uh, it is an acronym that stands for the main administration of camps. So that becomes. So that is actually like um, the FBI, or an, a, a department within the FBI, CIA. And it is the, the chief office of the camps. And <clears throat> it was in the 1930s within what was called the People's Commissariat of 
Internal Affairs, the NKVD, and I've given you all of the various name changes. Uh, it became the Ministry of the Interior, uh, and then it became uh, the Committee of State Security, the MGB, the KGB, but it's all the same ball of wax. The Gulag is the administrative center, sort of like the Bureau of Prisons uh, within Interior or Justice. Uh, so that's the technical acronym, but I'm using the word Gulag here for the broader sense of the Gulag. Uh, that is the entire network, not just the office that sits in Moscow, um, but the entire network of punitive or corrective institutions or installations that were run by the Ministry of the Interior. And uh, anyone who lived in, inhabited, or was consigned to one of these institutions or installations had to report to uh, Interior to the, in its, whatever its various manifestations were, its names were over the period. So this includes the most familiar concentration camps, um, which were called Konslageri. So I mean, that's what they were called. They were called concentration camps. Then corrective labor camps, special settlements, juvenile corrective labor colonies, and the special project, the specialist forced labor organizations called Sharashki. Uh, which are the subject of Solzhenitsyn's The First Circle. So <clears throat> some of you may be familiar with this wonderful website at George Mason University. How many of you have used it? One? Okay, Shannon has two. Okay, so for the rest of you, I thought we would have a, a little go to it, and we'll just look at the first uh, few moments of uh, the overview. I think it's two minutes, this little overview presentation. Make sure the speakers are up. Okay, so <clears throat> that gives you a sense of what this website has. It has resources for teaching. Uh, it's, so I'll just leave it to you to explore that. Of the uh, points that we were made in that little overview, let's just remember, anybody remember how many people were in the camp system? 18 million. And then do you remember what the next figure was and what he, what he, sent into exile, and then uh, one and a half million killed, executed. So uh, that should, there's a clue to where this talk is going, uh, which was where did the gulag penetrate, uh, how did, where did, when did, uh, did the gulag penetrate daily life in the Soviet Union? And so let's start off with where did the gulag penetrate daily life? So just a reminder of some key dates in the development of the Gulag. Remember that the Cheka, that is the uh, security police, and it's very important when we teach about this, and I say this, I use the we here because it's as, it's as hard for me to do as it is for you to do and for all of my colleagues to do. This is not a secret police. This is a security police. It is in no way secret. Everyone knows they exist. It's very utility comes in the fact that it exists. So uh, try to discipline yourself as I'm constantly trying to discipline myself to use the phrase security police as opposed to secret police. So the Cheka was established in December 1917 uh, within months of the Soviet um, founding in October. During the Civil War, uh, before you have the formal office of the main administration or chief administration, of camps in 1930, you already have forerunners to the full system of camps and special settlements. So during the Civil War, that's when there are considerable konslageri, or concentration camps, and they were primarily for prisoners of war who were seized, but that's also uh, where they would put hostages of families. This was particularly true when they would come into villages in the central part of Russia during the Civil War where the peasants had been active opponents of the Bolshevik regime. They would come in and take all of the women, anyone except the adult males who were out in the forest fighting or something. They would just sweep up the entire population and put them inside barbed wire and hold them in a concentration camp. So, uh, but this is also, the concentration camps is also where they would put the families of former 
imperial officers who refused to serve in the Red Army, so they would take the families hostage and put them in these concentration camps and so forth. So uh, from the very beginning, there were, there were camps. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the other aspect of the Gulag before 1929 uh, are the repurposed Soviet, I mean, Tsarist prisons. So all of the main Tsarist prisons, many of which some of the leaders of the new Soviet government had themselves inhabited as revolutionaries, they're simply repurposed uh, and used now to hold the opponents uh, of the uh, Soviet regime and the common criminals as well. Um, and the categories, just to remind you of those who would be taken in, would be the Orthodox priests, people who are on the wrong side of party battle, so the Trotskyists, the socialist revolutionaries, uh, former people, members of the royal family, and so on. Now, we usually date the uh, founding of the Gulag system with uh, the Solovki, Solovetsky Island special purpose camp that was set up in 1923, and I'll show you in the map in a minute where that is. Uh, and many of the intellectuals or people who were from the wrong party, uh, the suspect political prisoners who were arrested in the course of the Civil War and after the Civil War, and certainly after 1923, were sent up to Solovki. And so that's where you begin to have this, this concentration camp for political prisoners up in the camp. And in some ways it becomes an emblematic camp. But the other reason we consider it a foundational camp in the Gulag is, is that it was there that the notion of using forced labor to build the new Soviet state uh, was founded. So the system of so-called correctional labor was developed at, uh, at the Solovetsky Island camp uh, by a former inmate, as it so happens. Uh, you also have in the 1920s the first of the forced deportations of entire ethnic groups, uh, most notably the Don Cossacks for having resisted Soviet rule. So all of these things have already happened in the 1920s before we get to the institutionalization of the bureaucracy of the Gulag. Can you tell I'm a historian? <laughs> okay, so, um, so the where question. Uh, I am using lots of maps uh, in my teaching and in my writing. <clears throat> uh, I just think it's so important for uh, this iconographic generation of students to be able to visualize these things. And to follow on um, Mr. Estes' comment, uh, it, I do think we need to do more in geography than we do in the United States. And the Soviet students certainly did know a lot of geography. So um, this is an exercise I certainly will be using in my classes. Thank you, uh, because preparing this, I see what's coming down the line. So here we have the Memorial. Memorial is the major advocacy organization. I'll get to it at the very end of the lecture, established uh, at the end of the Soviet regime to be an advocacy and commemorative organization for victims of political repression. So this is Memorial's map of Gulag camps, also available on Wiki, um, and then we can compare that to population distribution in the Soviet Union, and then we put these side by side. So you can see the class exercise very quickly. Um, what is the relationship between where the Gulag installations were and where the population of the Soviet Union was? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> okay, right on top of each other. Yeah, I don't know how to do uh, overlays. I bet there's a new way to do this. Uh, yes. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Thank you, thank you. All right, so, um, let's see. So, as it says here, the Gulag camps were near or in populated areas, or as that little overview said at the beginning, Gulag installations also populated, or we can indeed say colonized, they would have said, the government would have said settled, sparsely populated regions. So the gulag system becomes not only a way to extract forced labor, but it also is a way to do forced resettlement 
and to colonize underdeveloped regions where there are important resources or where there are important uh, aspects of new Soviet infrastructure that need to be built. Okay. Yes? Um, where were the Cossacks deported to? Central Asia and Kazakhstan. That's, Kazakhstan becomes the great dumping ground of the Soviet era. Has anyone been to Kazakhstan? No. Um, I'm not sure. I'm I've just been invited to go. I'll <laughs> explain why. But um, Kazakhstan is where not only they, uh, it's where they did all their nuclear weapon testing above and underground, so it's incredibly polluted area. Um, but it also was, throughout the Soviet period, the destination for multiple deported groups, undesirables. And uh, so it is, uh, it is the end of the line in the gulag for many, many peoples. Uh, and for that reason, in interviewing some of these child survivors, they would be sent there as political enemies, but they were called living side by side with the deported peoples from Chechnya and Crimean Tatars and so forth, who were also living there in horrible conditions. So for that reason, Kazakhstan, this is not the subject of this talk, but in Kazakhstan, there are very interesting things going on in terms of memory of the gulag, museums of the gulag, commemorative sites and so forth, because guess, you know, they're not Russia, so they are able to do something quite different. Does that help? Does that begin to answer the question? OK. So um, I thought we'd start off with decolocization of 1930 to 1933. Uh, I don't want to bore you. So just to, how many of you need a quick little uh, lecture on what decolocization was? OK, a few. All right. So let's see if I can do it quickly. Um, It's sometimes referred to as the war against the peasantry. I've already mentioned the peasants once uh, in relationship to the concentration camps and mentioned that they had resisted Soviet rule during the Civil War. Uh, they were considered to be the um, most stubborn uh, problem in the Soviet Union and the major obstacle to Soviet modernization. Uh, you may recall that when, in 1900, roughly 85% of the population were still peasants. Uh, Russia is not a, a majority urban population until the mid-1950s. So uh, the majority population are these traditional peasants. And uh, they don't know what to do with them. And so m many of the debates about the 1920s at the upper levels of government are how are we going to turn these into good workers, good communists, because they so stubbornly resist Soviet modernization efforts and so forth. Um, not everybody was opting for a murderous approach, but the man who came out on top was. That would be Joseph Stalin. So in 1929, he declared a war on the so-called prosperous peasants, the kulaks. Uh, this is not a term that he invented. It's not even a term that Lenin invented in, in his work, The Development of Cop Capitalism in Russia. Kulak had existed in the Russian vocabulary from the middle of the 19th century uh, when would-be reformers had tried to go to the village and they kept running into uh, these uh, the strong men of the village who constantly were frustrating outsiders who would try to get in. So um, these were the strongest households, the most prosperous households, and generally the most respected households in any given community. Uh, they were the most likely to be the literate households in any community. So uh, when the state, the Soviet state, decided to embark on forced collectivization, the elimination of private farming and land, um, they anticipated that these kulaks, that is the most prosperous, most respected, most literate uh, members of the community would be their chief obstacles. And Lenin had already dubbed these prosperous families the capitalists in the village in his work, The Development of Capitalism in Russia. So Stalin announced in 19, late December 1929 uh, that they would be eliminated as a class. 
In fact, it was referred to as the liquidation of the kulaks as a class. And the word to liquidate is very, or they were to be exterminated. And this language was not accidental because they were the parasitical vermin of the countryside who were to be exterminated. So <clears throat> in early 1930, February 1930, uh, party leaders throughout the agricultural regions of the Soviet Union received quotas of numbers of households they were to identify as being kulak households. And they were given three categories, what they were to do with these kulak households. Uh, they were either to, well, they were all to be expropriated. Down the line, they were all to be expropriated. Uh, the least heinous of them could stay in the community. Um, the next least heinous would be forcibly exiled, forcibly deported, uh, the entire family. And then the most heinous would be forcibly expropriated, the heads of the households executed, and the rest of the family sent out. So this map shows you decoulakization. Um, and I don't know how well you can see it. Let's see. But it's a rather complicated map, because it was a rather complicated affair. But <clears throat> these are the origin points. And as you can see, they're in the Great Black Belt region. Black Earth region. Sorry, not Black Belt. Black Earth region. Primarily Ukraine and North Caucasus. But there are also some origin points down here in southwestern Siberia. The train lines show you where they were sent to where the train lines ended. And then from there, the people who were deported in decoulakization were then sent by wagon or by barge or on foot into this vast undeveloped area, to, primarily to do timber felling. And so <clears throat> out here, up here and up here, uh, the decoulakized families were sent to what were called special settlements. The most important work on this topic is by a woman named Lynn Viola, V-I-O-L-A. And uh, the title of that book is The Unknown Gulag. And it only came out very recently, 2009, I believe. Lynn properly views this as the founding moment of the gulag as we know it. Uh, because beyond Solovki, beyond the concentration camp, because this, this whole operation had, took, took place in six weeks, beginning in February. People were packed into cattle cars and shipped off with what they could carry on their back and dumped out here to create so-called special settlements. And the special settlements were under the administration of the NKVD. So this is part of the Gulag. So there are all sorts of things that they learn, they figure out, and they're not the only ones in world history at this time, contemporaneously, 1930, who are observing and realizing what can be accomplished. Uh, what did the Soviet government realize they could get away with in 1930 by moving 5,000 from here, 23,000 from here, 20,000 from here, 12,000 from here, 14,000 from here, and so forth, uh, in the course of six weeks in the middle of the winter? Just visualize this. What, can you, what, what are some of, the, some of the scenes you think this must have entailed? Families being separated. Possessions what? So how do you envision the possessions lost? How does that happen? You're living in a village. Being packed up in rooms that's left behind or stolen. Okay. Who are the actors? If you had to stage this on a scene, what would you, what would you include in this? We need officials, I think, to carry it out. So I mean, it's got happening rapidly. So there's timetables, there's time frames. We need to get people out. We need to do it. You know, packed cars. We have to keep maybe records of who's getting into a car. 
you know, so I guess they learned from this that you can move population very rapidly away, like wherever you need to. So, I okay, mean, there's number one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so yes, it does prove that you can move large numbers of people in train cars very rapidly. So that's a lesson they learned. Yes, is it Barbara? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's the way the government's going to do anything they want. Okay, so the neighbors yeah. are taking yeah. a lesson Pay here. Attention. Okay, that's good. Yeah? I'm sorry, can't see Amanda. Amanda? Um, I was thinking about the equipment, the livestock, the land that's all left behind, and now basically controlled by the government. Yes, okay. One of the first things, people, once this wave begins, guess what people do? If you have livestock, and the definition of a kulak is a kulak has X number of cows and X number of horses. So once this begins and the rumors spread, what are you going to do if you're a kulak family? You're gonna kill your animals. So massive slaughter of uh, livestock. So um, how do you know who's a kulak? Remember that the government sent down an order that said you have to provide 5,000 kulaks. So imagine you're the district party official. What do you do? Anybody you want. Well, you're doing this to your own community. You are. I mean, it's happening within. You're doing it within your own community, so and the implication of that is? You, you pay anyone you that you've had an issue with to get rid of. Okay. What if you don't know all the villagers in your community? Then what do you do? How do you Somebody get those people? Someone else will rat them out. Somebody else will rat them out. Okay. So what else? So what is the government learning from this? You can, you can. They're learning how to get informants. They're learning what people will do to rise above. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. So this is a campaign that takes place uh, with really astonishing and uh, heart-rending violence at the local level of neighbor against neighbor, relative against re relative, um, violence against the heads of households, and of course there's the accompanying violence of all of the animals simultaneously being slaughtered and cooked. So the villages are just huge barbecue pits everywhere, um, which is going to be doing great damage to the um, livestock industry for the rest of the Soviet period, by Can the way. A figure, a rough figure for the number of people involved in the kulakization? Dekulakization. De Roughly uh, when it's when the people who are actually oh, so the people who are actually exiled, um, we're talking close to two million. But remember this is one of the things that I want to the major points of this a talk is that these are highly public events. So when you say how many people were dekulakized, there are the targets and then there are all the uh, collaborators and there are all the bystanders and witnesses. Okay? And then of course there are all the people who carry out the dekulakization. But one reason I also wanted to give you this map is for you to think about those train lines uh, which are suddenly full of convoys of cattle cars packed with people moving across them in February, March, and April of 1930. So um, this happened so rapidly that of course there were no facilities en route to receive them and uh, there were backlogs um, everything got clogged up. There were certain, so let's go back to the, certain transit stops along the way. One major one here is for people going up into this northern, northern timbering operation. Volga was one, Cutlass was another. So in Volga, what they did, Volga is an ancient medieval town. Uh, well known for um, the multitude of beautiful medieval churches. They simply appropriated all of the churches and they used it as a transit station to pile up all of these families in these churches until they could move them further up the line to something that could remotely resemble some kind of base, timber lumbering base. So <clears throat> what this means in the local geography of Volokta 
is that the trains pulled in, the trains opened up, and all of these families were marched through the city on foot and put into the various churches. And they had already been on the train sometimes for two weeks, three weeks, so there were a lot of dead bodies coming out of that. But people who grew up in Vologda, who were there at the time, this was not, it wasn't as if they said, go home and shut your doors, don't look at this. This is a highly public operation where all the citizens of Vologda see it. So in terms of how does the gulag penetrate daily life, if you're a citizen of Vologda, all of a sudden your town is being overloaded with these peasant families from the south in rags, with typhus, with diphtheria, uh, being deposited in your unheated churches, and uh, you are being forbidden to offer any kind of assistance to them. Uh, and Vologda is also a city which prides itself on its Christian values and philanthropy and, and hospitality to this day. So one of the uh, sets of documents that we have from decolocization is the letters of protest sent by local citizens of Vologda to the president of the Soviet Union uh, about this visitation upon their local population, uh, which is disease, but also that they cannot believe that they're seeing all of these children freeze to death dying of measles and diphtheria and typhus and so forth. So the gulag penetrates daily life by passing through en route to the destination during decolocization. To the right and cutlass, um, this is a mass grave site. Uh, when they went north from Vologda to Cutlas, they were dumped in a place called Makarika, uh, and it's right on the edge of the town of Cutlas that uh, was adjacent to this forest. And what you're seeing here is the commemorative cemetery that has taken shape since the 1990s for all the mass graves of all the children and adults who died in these transit camps when they were poured off the trains to live here without proper shelter or food. So how does the gulag penetrate daily life in Cutlass? Here too, no one was allowed to help these people. So you have right next to your homes, teeming camp of children dying and crying and feces everywhere and the smells, the, the, the tears, the sounds, everything of this mass population movement is right in your backyard. How do we know about this camp? I mean, this uh, cemetery, because an old woman who had uh, witnessed this in 1930 survived. So she wasn't an old woman back in 1930. Um, she had witnessed this in 1930, and she survived into the late 1980s. And in, in private, without any participation of anyone else, every year she went and made pilgrimages to all of the mass graves and blessed them and laid flowers on them and so forth. And as soon as the Gorbachev era uh, made it possible to talk about this and Memorial opened up a local branch, she got in touch with the director and she took them all out into this overgrown forest and now it is a huge museum to the Gulag. So let's just do this for a couple of other places. Narim is a place that was colonized, uh, settled through decolocization and subsequent <coughs> exile operations. In 1911, the population of the community of Narim was 895 people. In the 1930s to 1940s, 500,000 special settlers that is, decoulockized peoples uh, and other unsavories were sent out into this remote location into special settlements under the NKVD's administration. The woman in the middle of this family group, Alaftina Krasil Nukova, was seven years old when she was sent off, uh, separated from her family up a barge up the river to Narim. Um, <clears throat> she survived, her story is incredible, but the marvelous thing is that the man is her son, 
who is the leading historian of deculacization and collectivization in Siberia. He's the, he is now the surviving leading historian. The other leading, his partner ha died. And so here she is with her son and daughter. And of course, they live in Western Siberia. Why do they live in Western Siberia? Because she was sent there as part of deculacization. And uh, many of the family histories in Western Siberia are because they are descendants of deculacization and other such campaigns. Magnitogorsk, how many of you have read uh, John Scott's story of Behind the Urals? Or Steve Kotkin's wonderful story, studies of Magnitogorsk? This is the greatest steel town of the Stalin era. You can see that it's just south of the Urals. So here's the iconic image. Wikipedia also has this image. Um, <clears throat> but Stalin, uh, Magnitogorsk was also built by largely by Kulaks. And uh, in Kotkin's study of Magnitogorsk, he has a map which I wasn't able to scan for this uh, talk, but uh, there's a wonderful little diagram that he drew that shows you that the places where the Kulaks lived, the special settlers lived, in this emerging steel town uh, that was launched in 1929, uh, they're right next door to the factory and the other settlements. And the difference is they live in trenches behind barbed wire and the other workers live in barracks. But that's the only separation uh, between them. So again, how does the gulag penetrate daily life? If you're a young Komsomol worker who goes out to build the great steel factory that is Magnitogorsk, you're living right next to people living in pits because they are the Dekulakais, and you're watching them be marched um, to, under convoy, under guard, to work with you at, in this great construction project. Stalinsk, down, you can see slightly further south, a major mining and heavy industry development project of the Stalin era. Also, built by uh, the dekulakized and other undesirables. Uh, here you have from the memoirs of a daughter of a kulak named Maria Solomonik. I think I'll just give you the chance to read it rather than reading it out loud so you can get a sense of what housing was like in the gulag for the dekulakized special settlers. Equally important to me and interesting to me was this next section in her memoir <clears throat> when she talks about her mother trying to come up with some way to feed her two daughters. So not only is her mother going out and gleaning the fields, but most interesting to me it says, she brought them home, dried them, cut them up with a very sharp knife and made crude tobacco. She went to the bridge across the Ob, which never froze. It was warmer there, and sold glasses of it to the village men as they went back and forth to work. So this is another one of those little clues that uh, the villagers are also right there. And so all of this, this world of the gulag is completely intertwined with the non-gulag world. These are the kinds of trenches that people lived in. This is the remains of one of these zimlyanki, these dugouts, these pit houses in the community of Severodvinsk. So now we're going to go up to Severodvinsk. Severodvinsk is the nuclear power, the nuclear submarine base of, um, well, of the Soviet Navy and now the Russian Navy. It's the sister city to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I don't know if Shannon's ever had anything to do with them. I just hosted a group of five women from there uh, last week. Um, <clears throat> so Severodvinsk is a community that was literally built by slave labor. Um, so you see the location. It's north of Arkhangelsk. And the shot to the right is from this wonderful site um, that I'm also going to direct you to. So Chris is going to take me. This is from the Memorial Branch and the local museum and the local library. Um, this is a wonderful site and it is 
dedicated to the concentration camp that was called Yagrin Lag, Y-A-G-R-I-N-L-A-G, Yagrin Lag. And if you fall, you can either go directly there or you can look up Yagrin Lag on Google and it'll send you to this web address and then next to it it'll say translate this page. So you can work your way through all of these resources as well and get a clumsy Google translation but adequate for you to use uh, and adequate for your students to use if they want to do some research on this particular uh, Gulag installation. Okay, so let's... Yeah. So Yagrin Lag is a much more uh, sort of typical... Um, whoop. forced labor, corrective labor, concentration camp, as you imagine it in the gulag. Um, so it's the next one, I think. It's the oh, okay. it's the game. Okay. okay. So there we go. So I, I thought this, these population figures were interesting. Uh, the city became um, a new town in 1938. It was originally called Molotovsk after the Soviet political leader Molotov, and in a minute we'll look at a local map of it. And adjacent to it, this town is sort of like being in Boston and Cambridge with a river, with a sort of estuary in between. So Yagrin Lag is on the island of Yagrin, um, and so that's where the concentration camp was, where the people were sent to build the city. So originally, um, this sort of wasteland uh, is going to be turned into a nuclear submarine base and they need workers, so they send up a few Komsomol activists and the rest are the uh, forced laborers. So in 1928, there are up to 21,000 people who are living in Severodvinsk, of whom probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 are not prisoners. Okay, so they're all forced laborers. So this is a, the Soviet nuclear submarine, the equivalent of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, was built by slave labor. So this is what it looked like. And again, this, uh, well, I'll just go back from the, to this slide. This slide tells you that it's the um, population are one and the same of the city and the camp in 1938. But as we get after the war into the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, it shrinks in the 1950s to about a third, the population of the camp is equal to a third of the population as more and more specialists come as the nuclear sub base begins to develop and the Navy begins to move in, then the proportion of the concentration camp inmates shrank to a roughly a third. <clears throat> so if you imagine this in the 1940s, what you have here is a map. This was the first camp. This is the island. This is where they're building the factories. And here's a big factory here. And every morning at, when this first get, they would be marched from the camp over the bridge into the city and to work. And then they had to build these other um, camp installations. So again, very public, very much a part of the daily life of life in the Soviet Union uh, in this very uh, key military installation. This shows you another scheme of the, uh, the same situation, which here's a camp, um, another camp, and you have this long walk that they had to make every morning and evening to and from work. These are some images of the camp and of the children in the camp. Yep, Shannon. Um, so we've got steel and mining and eventually nuclear submarines. Um, is there any recognition to the people that they're taking out of their homes to what they can do or what they know, or is it just numbers of people going to different places? Like, they look at what their skills are? Is there any recognition? Oh, you mean is there a rational yeah. distribution? <laughs> I love that thought. The word that, the, um, so the most important word in Lynn Viola's book uh, is impromptu. Uh, unplanned, so the great contradiction is there's supposed to be all of this planning, but it's never properly planned. So it's grand visions that you can write down on a map um, and plot, but then 
you send people off with six weeks in 1930, and you know they're clogging the railroad. So there are all of these impromptu, chaotic conclusions. In the Sharashki, yes. In the special projects, in the special um, scientific institutes, some of the so, for example, if you go to the Yagrin Log site, one of the sections that they have uh, for their website is a um, an honor roll of specialists who were arrested and sent up there to build nuclear subs. So um, there was some of that that went on, but um, the, the great ma the vast majority of the people who are sent up there to do the manual labor are not being sorted uh, because initially, it depends upon the campaign, but initially, if you recall, the purpose of deculacization was to break the resistance of the peasantry. It was not to rationally distribute the most talented peasants in the village. Uh, and so that's, again, one of the great ironies. Not only does deculacization lead to the destruction of the Soviet Union's livestock, but it also leads to the destruction of the most prosperous, most able, most, uh, the best farmers, and so forth. So there's that irony as well. Is that, is that answering your question? Is that where you're headed? OK. All right. <clears throat> in Stalingrad in 1937, 1938, one of my informants described uh, what happened when her father was arrested. Stalingrad, Volgograd, a major, 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 major city, of course. Uh, and this is what impromptu the Great Terror looked like in the center of Stalingrad. Uh, there were a lot of prisoners, there weren't enough jails, so they enclosed a square not far from our house. The railroad bed ran by there, residential buildings were on this side of the bed, and along that side they enclosed the zone with barbed wire. They put up some kind of temporary wooden barracks and they put all these convicts there as their summer living arrangements. So we would run along this bed. We would wave, but you couldn't hear much. Okay. So again, impromptu, chaotic, public, and the children of the arrested fathers are running up and down the trail line waving at their dads um, as inmates of the gulag. So this is the gulag too. So how did the gulag penetrate daily life? So we've gone from where to how. So the first is the thing that I've been discussing, the way that I've been discussing, proximity to population outside the camps and along the transportation routes of the convoys. The other three ways that uh, the Gulag penetrated daily life was through what, uh, you'll see your name in a moment, Golfo Alexopoulos refers to as the revolving door, uh, something I came to understand fully from my interviews, visiting relatives who came and went to the Gulag, and then the correspondence between the relatives left at home and the inmates of the Gulag. So the uh, article by Golfo is uh, a very important article. Um, you can just take her name and you'll be able to Google her. <clears throat> but one of the, she nearly died by the way, so this is not easy research to do. Uh, the archives that enabled her to do this research had been transferred out of Moscow to a remote warehouse on the edge of a remote town in, um, Siberia, and she literally was medevaced out of there and in ICU uh, from the food poisoning. But she got a great article out of it, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she did live and go on to have two children. So this is a good this is a good thing. Her body survived it. But one of the things by doing a meticulous examination, really imagine doing this research, a meticulous uh, examination of these files upon files sitting in a warehouse out in the middle of Siberia, um, she came to understand that people were just revolving through the gulag. So that 18 million, you know, that's one in 10. One in 10. About that. So one of the things that we really hadn't thought about and understood so much until Golfa did this work and wrote this article was that people were coming in and out of the gulag. It wasn't just that they didn't just, they didn't all go there and die of exposure. Lots of them completed their terms and they came home. So the gulag was penetrating everyday life, but
by the sim simple movement of people in and out of the gulag as prisoners who completed their terms. Yes? I, I think that's one of the most significant differences between the concentration system of Nazi Germany and the gulags of the Soviet Union. And I don't think that that's right. I well, I think that lots of people think that the, the, uh, that the process and the how many got out and how many survived, that they're comparable. But this is huge difference in this respect. That's right. Uh, and remember that these were, if we went back to my second slide, it went from being called concentration camps to being called corrective labor camps. And if you go back to that overview that was done on Many Days, Many Lies, Lives, <laughs> sorry, Many Days, Many Lives, um, Steve, the, the author of the, um, the site, says that they were going to rehabilitate them or destroy them once and for all. But um, these were not designated death camps. The deaths, die, the deaths resulted primarily from horrible management, uh, chaos, impromptu solutions, bad planning, uh, and abuse. There's absolutely abuse. And it certainly is not unfortunate if they die, but uh, that's not the stated purpose of this. And that's why the Gulag continues to penetrate everyday life in the Soviet Union for as long as it does, I would say, to the present day. Barbara had a question. Where, if they moved whole families in this relocation, and then there's this revolving door of people that are, do they move them back? I mean, OK, so let's go two things. I'm sorry I've confused you. So you have the special settlements, uh, the, mass, the mass movement of entire families, village communities as part of the deculocization campaign. But you also have these uh, labor camps behind barbed wire uh, that you would visualize uh, from what you know of the word concentration camp, where single inmate prisoners are sent primarily as political opponents, unless they're pregnant or have a nursing baby, in which case the baby goes in with them. And once the baby is born, the baby is, is uh, kept in the, in the camp nursery. But they come in as singles. So, um, so your, the answer to your question is twofold. What happens in, when are people released from the special settlements? Again, that's an amnesty, and it begins, it only happens uh, right on the eve of Stalin's death. Okay. And then there are amnesties in, um, after Stalin's death for the political prisoners. So. <clears throat> People who are in the revolving door, the special settlers, uh, that's my next book, What Happens? <laughs> and it's called Rehabilitation. We'll get to it at the end. But it's a, it's a problem that has not yet been solved. How do you return the property to these people and so forth? Or how do you house them? Often, again, this happened um, after the war, uh, that people were released from the special settlements or released from the gulag camp itself, that is, they were permitted to leave the barbed wire, or they were permitted not to have to go report to the NKVD commandant of their settlement every two weeks, but they were not allowed to leave the region. So they, this, again, ensures colonization. Does that? Yeah. So okay. you could be given, like, let's say, single prisoner, six months sentence. If you're a political, you would be unlikely to be six months, but if you are given, if you're a petty thief, yeah. So you get, so you, if you are lucky to survive the conditions of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. splitting rocks, whatever else you're doing, you could then be let out, but you really can't go much further than that. You, it's only after the war that they say that people have to stay there forever, okay? okay? But, uh, and that will, that will shortly change because of Stalin's death. So, yes, people got out and people went home. But, interestingly, uh, the sentences tended to be five years, 10 years, 15 years. And often they're so broken by the experience and, all, and so separated from uh, their home community and so integrated in their camp community that they choose to stay in the region. 
Okay. I was just going to say, and plus that, if they had neighbors to sort of turn them in in a way, why would they probably want to? That's return? right. Many of the Kulaks felt like they cannot. I mean, they're very, they're very tragic. If you read the memoirs or interview these folks, some of them try to escape. Like Salomonic, who talks about living in the ditch. Her family had actually been in constant flight from dekulakization, uh, but they'd been turned in, and so. They tried to go back, but they couldn't go back. The, the neighbors, people made them live in a shed, you know, and so forth. So then, and then of course, then someone else said, they're here, the refugees are here, come get them. They're out of there. So this part, the problem of coming back into one's home community, especially for the peasants, was very difficult. Okay. So the revolving door is a way that the gulag is penetrating everyday life. Uh, the other is through visits. Uh, people, family members did have the right to come visit the inmate relatives if they're in a traditional camp situation. So let's talk, we're talking really primarily here about concentration camp, it, corrective labor camp, installations behind barbed wire. The prisoner can earn through good behavior the right to have a family member come visit, and the visit would be of a designated length of time, typically up to 24 or 48 hours. Okay. So um, interviewing these children of the Gulag, so this is a family of three girls, both of whose parents were arrested, the father shot, mother sent off to camp. Um, the older daughter, Ina, uh, sets off to go visit her mother in Kazakhstan on June 19th, 1941 from Moscow and arrives at the camp gates to visit her mother on June 22nd as war has just been declared. Um, so this is what happened in her visit uh, with her mother. Um, so she's describing the house of meetings, uh, all of the children who had arrived with her on the train. So again, remember, this is again, how does the gulag penetrate everyday life? She's not, they're not the only family on this train that's going from Moscow to Kazakhstan. There's a reason they're taking the train and going to Karaganda. Almost everybody who's on that train is there for is in some way connected with the gulag either through administration or there there's some bureaucracy associated or their relatives who are going to visit uh, so they would be assigned to a house of meetings and they have a little cot and they all sit in there and visit with their relative and then they get back on the train and go back to moscow okay having been to the gulag uh, some children when their mothers are after so after the war mother's released from prison, but not allowed to leave the region, then the children who are living in Moscow or, Saint, or Leningrad or some other major city spend every school vacation with their mother in these gulag locations. So these children are just like the migration of knowledge about the gulag that they're going uh, to and from the gulag. Valentin Morovsky, my absolute favorite of uh, such person, was a young man. Um, it's a very complicated story, but in short, in 1954, after he completes his own sentence in the Gulag and his naval service, his mother's still in prison, so he goes out to Karaganda to get a job, and he lives in Karaganda in Kazakhstan, and then he makes this weekly bus ride and then walk of 50 kilometers to spend time with his mother in the camps. Uh, and he describes about how, you know, he spends the night on the way in a haystack, and he's not alone, all the haystacks are full. Because everybody's walking, you know, everybody's on that bus for the same reason, they get off at the last stop and they start walking because they're trying to get to the house of meetings to see their relative, and they're all sleeping in the haystacks. And then he says, uh, you know, he comes in and he says, um, on the left side, let's see, he said, what really shocked me, I wasn't a little boy, but there was a whole line of women standing there, young and old, at the barbed wire. On the right side, there were as many as 50,000 people in this camp installation. Uh, they would stand there at the barbed wire, and I was a sailor, after all, I have to say, a gorgeous one. I couldn't get the, the picture to show you, but he was cute. Um, I had a striped vest and a pea jacket, and they would say to me, sailor, love me. It made me crazy, uh, and so forth. Um, and then he says that they would go to the little house for the meeting, and then he would spend an entire day, and then he would walk home, walk back to the bus station and go back. So again, this is that circulation of the gulag 
in everyday life. More visiting relatives, Svetlana Asinskaya described going to Kalima all the way to the far northeast from Moscow in 1944. And the, these children who used to go to Karaganda during their mother's post-war exile every summer. The other way that the gulag penetrated everyday life was that often relatives had to come retrieve the inmate. In this case, Ina Geister had to go pick up her mother at the end of her term. So her mother was officially released from her term in 1945. Her mom was a political, she was the wife of an enemy of the people. And so she had been arrested. This was actually a special camp, uh, which was a camp for wives of traitors to the motherland. And so many of these children, uh, this became part of the geography, their geographic knowledge of the Soviet Union. The other thing was very interesting talking to these children is that their map of the Soviet Union matches the map of Memorial. So that's how come they, they wouldn't have known about Kolyma and Karaganda and all of these camp installations except that's where their mothers or their fathers were sent and that's where the letters came from and so they had a sense of that. So her mother was a political enemy so she had to go pick her up. So um, it took her a year to earn the money. You can imagine, you know, she's an orphan. She has to get enough money to take a three-day train down to uh, this remote location to get her mother and bring her back. Um, so it took her a year to earn the money tutoring and then she went and uh, she was able to escort another inmate, but they had decided that her mother had to train her successor as the economist in this big sewing factory, and her mother's job wasn't complete, so Ina lived in the barracks for a month, okay? But um, her story actually gets better because then in 1949, she's arrested as a child of enemies of the people, and she goes to a special settlement. But she's, these are the lessons that she's taking in the gulag, and she's just bringing them back and forth to Moscow, because this is her lived experience. Um, the other way that the gulag penetrated everyday life is that, as I said, many inmates, when they are released from the camp, they stay in the camp region. Because if you go back to that previous map, of populated areas, and you remember these are major development projects. So imagine Magnitogorsk becomes the biggest steel city in the Soviet Union, and you're released. Land of opportunity. I'm staying here. I'm not going to try to go back and, you know, wrestle a life out of my previous life. So then the whole family moves to the, to the new colonized, slave labor developed, industrial mining center. So uh, that's another way that the gulag penetrated everyday life. The gulag also penetrates daily life through correspondence. Relatives are uh, having to have the right to send parcels to inmate prisoners. And uh, so there is this whole ritual. We're going to read a, in a moment a, a section from Ina Geister's uh, oral history interview about what she did to do this to send the parcels, but they also had the right, except during World War II, all correspondence rights were um, shut down during World War II, but except for 41 to 45, uh, letters were moving back and forth out of the gulag and into the gulag. So all of these families all over the Soviet Union were receiving postcards from gulag installations. Okay, so just those letters dropping into the mailbox um, were part of the gulag coming into daily life. Can I assume those were heavily censored? Oh, yes. And very much so, yes. So then how were these people treated who did, of the family who did remain receiving these letters? I mean, were they then also outcasted? I'll tell you in just a moment. Thank you. You anticipated me. <laughs> All right. So I just wanted, this is... Um, so this is one of my favorite moments in an interview. I said, Ina, at the end, I said, for our students, how did this life experience affect you? And she looked, she, her friend said, you'll love Ina. She has a tongue like a razor. Um, and she looked at me and she said, that's the stupidest question anyone's ever asked me. And she was only the second person I'd ever interviewed, and I was really <laughs> quite upset. Um, but she said, how do you think it upset me? And this is the first thing she described. She said, how do you think it upset, how do you think this influenced me? I'm a 12-year-old child and, and then she describes this. In order to get Mama a parcel when she had already been sent into exile, I had to leave the city of Moscow. Remember, she's 12 years old. 
They didn't accept parcels from the city of Moscow. We went to the town of Majaisk. Ma Maja I never can say that right. Majaisk. They accepted a limited number of parcels. So it wasn't guaranteed that your parcel would go. And the entire train, which left Moscow at 6 o'clock in the morning or around 5.30, was so packed with people who were sending parcels. So you had to climb the steps up to the bridge, then run across and go down to get to the post office to get in the number of people from whom they were still taking parcels once a month. And that was for the letter K. They did it by, so, you know, on X day, the letter K. Her mother's last name was Kaplan. So every day in Moscow, this is the scene departing from one of the major train stations that you have an entire train packed with people carrying parcels who are sending them to their relatives in the gulag. So this too is a way that it makes it into daily life. Okay, so uh, the when question. When did the gulag penetrate daily life? So um, I've, I've gone through a list here that gives you sort of the moments in the process and we're down to, if we go down to one, two, three, four, five, Sean's question. Uh, for relatives, their co-workers and acquaintances, the gulag, of course, penetrated daily life during the years of the relatives' absence in the gulag, that they had been sent to the gulag. Um, <clears throat> then uh, also we're going to drop down to lifelong stigma, and then I want to say a little bit about rehabilitation. So we'll just say a bit about those two. So children who are left behind, this is the woman who started this project for me. I met her in 1989. Um, she applied for membership in the Komsomol. She was living in exile. By then she's completely orphaned. Her father had been shot. Her mother had died in exile with her and her younger sister had died of tuberculosis. Um, so she's a complete orphan, but she's uh, made it to Komsomol age. She's a leading student. And uh, everyone in the class who's her age goes to the district party uh, headquarters. And um, I'll let you read her reminiscence of that moment. This was a very typical experience for the children that they were denied admission to the Komsomol. Um, and some, actually, I'll say, Chris, were denied in, uh, admission into the Pioneers. Ooh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, so even when they're six and seven years old, they're sent out of the room when all the other children are taking the oath and so forth. These uh, relatives, to answer your question, uh, they're stigmatized at the moment. They're stigmatized during the Gulag years, and they suffer lifelong discrimination through the end of the Soviet Union. Um, Maya, so this child, grew up to be this woman. Uh, she was an excellent teacher, and she recounts here, this is just a brief paragraph, about however much extra work she did, however many extra assignments she did, however many times she, was, she did inspection commissions or internal external reviews is what we call them. Uh, she was always denied any award, any honor, any honorarium, anything. Um, and right up until when she retired in the late 1970s, early 1980s, she had principals who would say to her uh, in faculty meetings if she would raise an objection, you know, she would have a, a principal say, I would be very careful if I were you. Um, we all remember who you are and who your father was. Uh, so the stigma, the, the having been uh, a relative or a child of someone who went into the gulag, who was a child of a gulag, uh, followed all the way through to the end of the Soviet Union and had real repercussions on one's career. Uh, and I can give you more details if you want to know. Uh, that's, so that was in the town of Smolensk, which is near the Polish border. This is Volgda, uh, this man. Uh, was a very bright man. He was an excellent tool maker. He was never given a promotion, even though every single one of his managers, assembly line directors, his co-workers, he was constantly being nominated for a promotion from the basis line of the assembly line. Uh, he was always turned down because his parents had been enemies of the people all the way to the end of his life. So he he, be, he began as a, as a lowly manual worker, and he concluded his career as a lowly manual worker. 
All right, how did the gulag penetrate daily life after Stalin's death? It's penetrated daily life through the process of rehabilitation and beginning as early, right, I mean, right after uh, Stalin's death. Stalin dies in March 1953. Uh, partial sort of quiet rehabilitations of major figures in the party began and they're restored. Their name, their good name is restored. Their pensions are restored. Uh, their families are given uh, apartments and so forth. Um, and then it sort of spreads from 1953 to 1964 that more and more categories of victims of the gulag and inmates of the gulag are receiving items such as this, the rehabilitation certificate. And what these rehabilitation certificates typically say are, and these are only though for political prisoners, this is not something that all those victims of degulagization got, it was just for the political prisoners. Um, that it says essentially uh, we have reviewed the case and that there's no evidence of a crime therefore this person is fully rehabilitated and uh, in exchange for rehabilitation they got two months of salary so the surviving relatives could go to the previous the last employer and with this rehabilitation certificate and request two months salary um, which is important in 1953. This is still the post-war era, and by the way, all throughout the Soviet Union, people are living in those pit houses. Uh, right up to 1956, people, because of the destruction of residential housing. So to be given two months' salary, uh, people, they took these certificates and got that money. Yes, I'm just wondering Jennifer. How many generations does this last for? I mean, is it, if you're a child of the, the, those initial purges, that, I mean, now, what about the grandchildren? Is it carrying on? Which? So this, you're asking two questions. Uh, the stigma or the rehabilitation benefits? I, I think more the stigma because the rehabilitation, I'm thinking once you're rehabilitating then, with that person. Okay. Um, the stigma lasted certainly through all of the children's lives, and it also lasted into the grandchildren's lives. Valentin Morovsky, the man who walked to, his, to visit his mother and slept in the haystack, uh, he never got a college education, but he worked like a slave so that his three children did, and his two, all three of them went into physics. Uh, and all three of them did gain admission to uh, very fine institutes of engineering in Leningrad, but they were all denied um, admission to any department within the institution that had any possible military ramifications because their grandparents had been enemies of the people. They live in the U.S. now. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, some of them do because they, but so yes, it did. And this is why, I'll just say very quickly, people didn't know their family histories. Um, so parents tried not to tell these stories so that their children didn't know that they were stigmatized. Um, but that's another, I'll, let, I'll leave that for question and answer. So the most important benefit was the apartment. Uh, this is the photograph, I like this photograph. This is of a woman um, the, who's sitting in the apartment. Her mother was given as um, the wife of someone executed during the purges. And in this image you see a bit of the apartment in Moscow. The larger photograph is of her father who was uh, arrested and executed and then rehabilitated and then the smaller one is um, of her mother. So you sort of see the whole thing within this this one and it's a one-room apartment but it was very valuable. Now there's an odd thing when you start interviewing these folks um, a remarkable number of these people who were finally given apartments through their rehabilitation were always given apartment number 58. <laughs> now, <laughs> article 58 of the criminal code is the, co is the article under which people were deemed enemies of the people. And I just, it's not just one, it's not just two, it's not just three. Uh, that's often in a nine-story building they're given the, the number 58 apartment. But anyway. Were they both? Oh. Or wired especially? Even after they were left? You know, I've never asked them. Um, I don't know. Seems like a very controlled situation. It could be. Um, it could be. 
I don't know. I'll have to ask. Isn't that funny that it never occurred to me? So um, in 1991, the Gulag continues. Um, one of, the, of course, in the Gorbachev era, the e eruption of public discussion of the Gulag and Stalinist repressions flooded Soviet everyday life with the Gulag. And this led in the very last months of the Soviet system with the publication of the issuing of two major laws, new laws of rehabilitation. First one in April for the rehabilitation, and I haven't talked about this category of gulag, people sent to special settlements, but entire national groups, Koreans, Chechens, Crimean Tatars, people with German roots, and so forth, uh, who had also been sent out into those remote territories. So in uh, April of 1991, there is a law on the rehabilitation of victims of um, national deportation, we might call it ethnic cleansing, uh, and they are given a whole series of benefits. Uh, and then in October of 1991, there's a new law on the rehabilitation of victims of political repression, that is the political enemies, uh, that's October of 1991, and then the Soviet Union falls in 19, December of 1991. So that we can say that the Gulag penetrated daily life uh, right down to the final hour, and in some people would argue, determined the, fo the final hour. Uh, Gulag memorials began to go up from 1989 forward, so another way the Gulag penetrates everyday life is the presence of all of these Gulag memorials in towns like Vologda, Kutlas. So not just St. Petersburg and Moscow, but all of these transit stations and mass graves and so forth all throughout the Soviet territory. So whose everyday life did the Gulag penetrate? All personnel of the Gulag system, I haven't talked about them, but everyone who worked in this system, uh, which you can I imagine this was a huge employment agency from Moscow to Kalima, all of the victims, their families, their neighbors, their co-workers, the bystanders along the routes of deport deportation and transportation, I have a colleague at the University of New Hampshire whose uncle told him on, he's from Western Siberia, his uncle told him on his deathbed that he had to conf confess something to him. And uh, the confession was that during deculakization, uh, the NKVD had come to his house and uh, taken his family hostage and said, you take this barge of kulaks up the river and dump them on the island or I'm shooting your family. And he took them up and left them to die. Um, so uh, the bystanders along the routes of deportation became, in some cases, unwilling collaborators. Of course, the people who live near the installations, and then, of course, teachers, doctors, nurses of wives and children of enemies of the people or deportees that they had to, especially teachers. There's a whole story about how the gulag penetrates the classroom and how teachers have to respond when they have these children of enemies of the people in their classroom. The, I'll cut to the chase, they saved them. Um, the Communist Party apparatus, and then of course, once these rehabilitation certificates are there and the rehabilitation gets you free meds, free dental work, an apartment, free transportation on the bus, and every person who receives the rehabilitation certificate is having a little uh, encounter with Gulag in his or her everyday work life. So to conclude, where did the Gulag penetrate everyday life? Everywhere, when, always, how in almost every venue of social or work or educational interaction, whose everyday life did the gulag penetrate the life of every conscious or sentient Soviet citizen? That's it. <laughs>